Welcome to Needham School Spotlight. I'm Dan Goodykanst, Superintendent of Schools. The Needham School Committee is responsible for providing leadership and guidance to the Needham Schools. And during this past year, particularly during a year of pandemic and COVID, they have provided tremendous guidance, leadership, and transparency for the community. Joining me today to talk about the work of the School Committee is our School Committee Chair, Andrea Longo Carter. Welcome. Thank and you. Vice Chair, Dr. Connie Barr. Nice Thank you both here. for uh, for being here. It has been a pretty extraordinary school year. We're, we're not done yet, um, and not just school year, but really in all of our lives. Um, I, I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about that today. I, but before we get into that, Andrea, as as chair uh, for the for the last year, um, I'm going to ask you maybe share with us what what's the thing that you are most proud of when you reflect on this past year of your leadership in the school committee that, uh, that's happened, that, that you've been working on? I think what I'm most proud of is that we were very thoughtful in our decision making um, and, and we really struggled with the decision making about what to do. I think back to August when we were trying to decide how we were going to go back to school, whether it would be hybrid or fully remote. Um, and I think I'm really proud of the work that all of us on the school committee did, um, but certainly the work that was done um, within central administration and in all of the buildings to really think through that decision and what it meant for our students and staff. And I'm really proud that, you know, throughout this year, except for a couple points when we had to, you know, go remote with certain grades or certain schools, that we have had in-person learning for all of this year. Um, and, and I think that being able to do that was really critical and important and I'm I'm proud that we were able to to accomplish that for our students and for our staff and families yeah and I and I know throughout the year and even actually before um, I remember when you first became chair one of the things that you said that you were interested in doing and, and you have subsequently done is really um, acknowledging people who pull through and help out in the schools and do things for the community that was something that was a particular interest to you um, here's an opportunity. Who are who are some of those who are some of those folks besides our families and students, um, who you know in particular that you would acknowledge they've done some uh, some heavy lifting in the past year. Um, I think in our schools it's 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 everybody. Um, in particular, I think the principals have just done an extraordinary job. You know. I, working with students, with teachers, with families, and figuring out all the tiny details about how are we going to move kids throughout the building? How are we gonna feed them? How are we gonna make sure that, you know, the right supplies are in the right places and they're not, you know, everything, every little detail has been taken care of. Um, so certainly the principals, I also think, um, you know, Barbara Singer has, the, the amount of communication and education with, with I think really in terms of families where I have seen most of it about what does it mean, how do we work through the different scenarios of this happened, I, am I a close contact, do I need to be tested, when can I come back to school, I mean all of that has been tremendously challenging um, and, and has required a lot of work and thought um, and I guess the only other people I would say are really the folks on the town side who supported us, you know, Kate Fitzpatrick, the building maintenance, um, the custodians, that work has been tremendous in enabling us to keep everybody uh, in school this year. Yeah, it has been uh, our partners on the town side, um, including public health. Um, and I, I, you know, there have just been people have just stepped up. I, you know, I, I, I recall earlier this year when the town manager called me and said, Dan, I want you to know that early, when I, and I say August, um, that uh, the select board has voted to uh, make keeping the schools reopened safely their number one priority this year, and I was really, I was really, I was, I was kind of taken aback because I'm thinking, well, that you know, it's kind of the school committee's role, but in fact, this really was and is a community-wide effort. It couldn't be any one thing that any one board could could handle, and um, the select board, uh, even the finance committee, and other boards, public health, uh, you know, have stepped forward. It, it has been exceptional in that way. Um, you, you know, for for Connie, when you when you think about this past year, uh, you know, you've been 
a, we've been able to consult with you just as Barbara Singer has really provided some consultation and learning because of your unique, unique role as an internist um, and also a member of the school committee. Uh, you know, what, what, what has surprised you? When you think about this pandemic, what has surprised you maybe even in, you know, in your own professional life or personal life and within the schools? What surprised you in the last 12 months about what's happened or, and how we've reacted? One thing when you mentioned both of those that is, um, is a surprise is the progress we've made over this year, starting from frightened, unsure, not knowing what was gonna happen in two weeks, much less in the future, how bad this was gonna be, how many people would be ill, to a time when we understand a lot more about COVID-19, where we now have vaccinations, where we have now seen our schools able to be in session almost all the time, as Andrea said, so it, it is amazing. Now it's years a long time, but we've come a long, long way. So that's one thing. Um, I think the challenges of teaching online, um, maybe it's not a surprise, but in a way it's a surprise. That's really hard for teachers to manage a, a group of students in class and then out of class, even though we didn't have a whole lot of synchronous learning, which teaching both groups at once, because that, that really is very difficult to do. You can't really focus on either group adequately. Um, and how you engage students uh, when we're trying to do hybrid learning. Those are things that are tougher than, maybe not tougher than I would have thought, but I didn't know about them. And we, we learned a lot more about those as well. One thing that surprised me was how much time it takes to contact trace. It was very important, but boy, does it take a lot of time. It took a lot of our nurses' time, it took a lot of public health time, and it was really important, um, but it was surprising to me. Um, Another thing I think about is some of our students do better with remote learning in some ways, whether it's because the high school student can roll out of bed at 8.15 and start their classes at 8.30, and that's better for them than the hour and a half ahead. Just something for us to realize as we go forward that, again, we try to differentiate our instruction and how things go, but we can learn more about that as time goes on. I also want to say that I'm extraordinarily grateful to all of the leadership. Your leadership, Dan, your leadership, Andrea, the principals, and then each, each teacher, each staff person, the, uh, the folks who worked in nutrition, who somehow managed one of the most difficult times of the day, which is how do you keep students safely distanced but able to have their snack, lunch, or whatever. Those are some of the things that I think about when I think about this year. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned nutrition. I, it also extends to um, you know, uh, transportation services, rethinking yes. how we can safely transport students. I mean, who ever thought we would be thinking about that and how wide we had the window open on the bus. And, oh, man, yes. And, and the reality that we learned that there are about 300 children in this community, give or take, uh, who have some level of food insecurity and have depended on us for these free meals we have provided last summer. And fortunately, we're going to be able to provide them again this summer the United States Department of Agriculture's uh, plan, um, but I did not know that, and the, the absolute reliance these families had on those meals and the ability of our staff to say, we'll be there, we'll help us set up a tent out in the parking lot and figure out a way to get these meals, really good nutritious meals prepared and, and uh, received by kids, Something, things that we hadn't thought about before. So the, the creativity and the resilience and the you know, all hands on deck approach that the staff uh, really um, made, I think, really has helped us, uh, you know, get through uh, from in all that. You know, there have been a lot of challenges that we've overcome, a lot of things that we've learned. Uh, you mentioned contact tracing, uh, a term that a year ago I would know what you're talking about, um, along with a lot of the other things that uh, that you know we've we've uh, we've learned. Um, and it's also true that there's some things in this past year that maybe we didn't hit just right, that you know, upon reflection, we, we might have been able to, to go in a different direction. What, Andrea, what, what have you heard from the community or as you reflected on it from the school committee and that you know, here's something we, you know, uh, I wish we had maybe thought about differently or there's an opportunity to rethink it or? I think it's, it's hard with the benefit of hindsight to, to say what, what, what could we have done differently in that moment when we were making the decision. I think certainly now looking back there are things we might have done differently. You know, for example, we might have tried to structure the elementary program so that there was more live or synchronous instruction. Um, 
than we were having. Uh, similar to the way the middle schools were able, you know, they had a different structure, so they were able to, to, to schedule the day differently. Um, some of those things, I think, um, striking the right balance of communication, I think, was definitely a challenge in terms of letting the community know what we were doing and thinking about, but we were still thinking about things. So it was a little bit hard to say, well, we're thinking about, it, it felt strange to say, we're thinking about all these, you know, a thousand possibilities or ways we might be able to make this work, but yet a lot of that was just brainstorming. And so figuring out how much do you tell about the thousand things we're considering versus thinking through them and making sure that, you know, well, we can do it, we could do this, we absolutely can't do this for that. A and just figuring out what's the right level of detail to provide, I think, about all of the different possibilities that we considered. Because that was something that, you know, parents said, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Did you try this? What about this? There were very few examples that people put forward that we hadn't thought about, but we didn't necessarily tell people that we'd thought about all these different things. And, and this is why we ended up where we were. Yeah. Partly it took so much time to figure out how, where we could land to make something work. That's, that as much as we like to communicate, that's one of our belief systems in the school system and from the school committee, it, we were actually doing the work all the time. You were doing the work all the time. So Andrew did a great job of responding to people who had questions, but it was hard to let people know we really are considering possibilities. Well, and I, you know, one of the other things I think that, that came out of this that families, you know, started to realize, and, it, and it's, it's part of the work of the school committee and school administration and our teachers, is that one of the things that is a factor in our, you know, our structure and organization is that we work and we have contracts with employees and we collectively bargain with our employees. And I think one of the things that, that came up, um, you know, there was, a, there was a broad narrative out in the media about the, the Massachusetts Teachers Association and teachers not wanting to go back to school. Well, that was a statewide and in some cases a national narrative. It wasn't really a local narrative. The Needham Education Association, which represents our staff, teachers and teacher assistants, nutrition service workers, they are the bargaining agent for the staff. And we had to sit down with them to come up with some planning and, and negotiate some of this because we had to make sure that the, the uh, um, uh, classroom situation was safe and the school situation was safe and it was going to make sense. And so it was hard to talk about some of that when it hadn't all been resolved. Um, and I know some families were frustrated by that and maybe even became aware that our, our, our teachers are part of a, um, a, a bargaining uh, unit and they hadn't thought about them in that way before but it, it was it was true and our partners in the NEA uh, they really were collaborative they, they were very much focused on providing for their staff but they also wanted to make sure it made sense for students um, and I think that's why overall at the end of the day we've been successful even though uh, you know some of it was imperfect and you know there might have been different ways I know I always think a hundred different ways that different conversations could have gone or opportunities for communication could have gone that that uh, went this way when they could have gone that way. Um, so there are always things that, that we can we can improve. Um, I think the key is looking at those, thinking about it. Hopefully we won't have to deal with this exact, this exact situation again, but being able to be thoughtful about what maybe we could have done differently and use that going forward. And I think that um, we just did not know how safe our staff and students would be if we moved more quickly than we did, although we all wish now perhaps that we'd moved a little more quickly in some places. This is all retrospective. Yeah, yeah. I think that was it. It was the unknown around it. I, you know, and one of the new terms I learned, zooming, uh, you know, something that wasn't, you know, top of mind a year ago. Now it is. One of the things we learned is that that can be a tool for communication for families. You know, you can reach a broad audience and have some interaction as, you know, it's not, it's not the best tool, but it certainly uh, can be better than an email and it does provide a little bit more level of engagement. That's one of the things that, uh, you know, we can perhaps continue to think about how we use it to engage families, um, particularly when lives are, are, are so busy. Um, what, you know, when you think across the town, uh, we touch on this, touch on this a little bit, but how has the, the community come together? 
Uh, what, what have you seen in Needham as, as families have tried to support one another or the town? Um, you know, we've worked with, uh, you and I were, have worked specifically with public health. Um, what are some things that you've seen that have worked well that, that you know, you've been proud of in, in, from the town? I mean, you start with town government. The fact that they stepped right in and said this is just tremendously important, as you identified earlier, that the staff in the town worked on our buildings incessantly for a long time to get them ready because we now realize how important ventilation and um, uh, filtering are, all of those things. I think the Needham Community Council and the donations to the Needham Community Council specifically to help our families with food insecurity or our students who needed extra support going into school or whatever it was, um, uh, the community council will say that the community was very generous and the community council is looking for ways to now help the schools this coming summer to um, help our students who maybe are, are suffering in some way or another and need more help somehow. So that's one really big way. I never felt like the community was resisting what was going on. They were just supporting. How do you feel about that? I, I think your, your point about the community council, I think was really one that struck me. Lots of, I think, programs came about to really focus on families who suffered in some way due to the pandemic, whether it was, you know, losing a loved one, losing a job, um, being ill. I think that, that there was a tremendous sense of there are people in our community who are really suffering and what do they need? How can we help them? And I think, um, you know, another big push that I saw was efforts to help local businesses. Um, the same businesses that, that we turned to to support, you know, the schools and the town and various initiatives and programs, I really felt like the community stepped up, you know, particularly in the area of the restaurants to, to support a lot of the local businesses that have supported all of us. Well, and I think also that some of the town services from, um, you know, the police department, yes. uh, fire department, <laughs> they stepped in in different ways. Police, our school resource officers, to continue to step in to support families, pick students up from home to get them to school, uh, to make sure a child has a meal. Our police officers in Needham have been doing that. Um, and that happens anyhow. However, during this time, uh, when the needs have been a little greater, uh, the town has really, uh, has really stepped forward. Another area that, that affects our families maybe a little separately is the Council on Aging, or the Center at the Heights, I should call it. And there was even a program, I believe, when youth would help um, older folks with devices so that they could keep in touch FaceTime or whatever with their families, because there was so much isolation, not only for our students, but for other members of our community. So those kinds of cooperative efforts, which often involved our students, um, were great. Well, and Needham Youth Services as well has been providing Absolutely. some ongoing support and counseling for families in a really you know, challenging time for, for a lot of students. Um, you know, on, on that note, maybe I'll jump to this real quickly. Connie, you and I have served on the Joint Committee on Health and Safety, which has involved public health partners, staff, uh, school administrators. Uh, tell us a little bit about the work that, that's been going on there with, uh, and certainly involving Tim McDonald, another yes. partner. Right, um, and I just have to mention that one of the members of the Joint Committee on Health and Safety is a, from the Harvard School of Public Health and has a strong interest because he has elementary age grandchildren in the school system. We valued his ex expertise, of course, but he also brought that practical family orientation. So we met frequently. It was a very good group of people, including boots on the ground, uh, teachers who are actually in our schools. Um, who could really speak to anxiety from the teachers or what the questions were, what was actually going on with our students. We had also communication from the individual schools, health and safety committees, which helped us know what was going on. And then we started off each meeting with information from Tim McDonald, who has been just a tremendous resource through this entire uh, time. Um, with what was actually going on with the numbers. We developed a dashboard so that you could see what was going on in the schools. Um, and we learned about the positivity rates and how many cases were there were. And then um, brainstormed, talked about what are the questions, what are the issues, what do we have to decide, what do we have to understand with teachers, members of the NEA, public health, the school physician, um, who is a tremendous resource on what it means to children to have COVID-19 in the community. Um, the, the chairperson of the um, Board of Health, who has expertise in testing and other 
areas related to COVID-19. And sometimes there would be specific questions we were trying to answer. Just to look forward a little bit, this last meeting, we spent time thinking about in group and small groups about what do we need to be thinking out about for next year? What things might we not have? What's the change? What, how do we have to look at things? And um, that was very useful to keep moving forward. So we met nearly weekly, uh, mostly missing only um, school vacation weeks, give somebody a little break. Um, and just going from the very practical in the classroom, in the school, to folks who have the more theoretical knowledge uh, but are very connected was very useful. And, and what I've appreciated about the committee is that we have been data driven and we've really yes. tried to use the science. I mean, there certainly has been the anxiety that's brought to the table and the unknown and the concern and also the science and the data that really did help drive our decisions yep. um, and help make some changes. You know, some, some maybe took some time, but we made some decisions that really helped impact the schools and how we were going to operate and, and to reassure everybody, staff and families that we're trying to do things that are focused on their health and safety because that, that I, I you know, continue to say is the primary responsibility that I have um, and, and the Joint Committee on Health and Safety really has helped make that happen, uh, which has been powerful. Two other people to mention again are Barbara Singer, the Director of Nursing. Um, she has been in, in, integrally involved in all of this, of course. Um, and then the um, a member of the Department of Nutrition again. And I know that's come up several times, but they're very connected to the students. They had a lot of both legwork to do and planning to do and supervision to do to um, get meals to our students in a safe way. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. You mentioned our school physician. I will have to give yes. a shout out to Alan Stern because he's well known in the community and he has been not, he's been a source, a, a uh, sometimes a daily source of inspiration and questioning for me. Um, and uh, he really has helped uh, provide a level-headed, thoughtful approach to how we're going to approach uh, the pandemic. When I was a little crazed and anxious, he would calm me down. You know, um, that has been all-consuming, and yet the work of the Needham Public Schools, providing a great education for our students based on the portrait of a Needham graduate and the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks has continued. Mm -hmm. it, it's been interrupted and there have been fits and starts, but it's continued. And one of, the, one of the initiatives that we, and I know the school committee takes great pride in, is to really be thinking about um, how we can become a more equitable community and how we can be a more anti-racist uh, community, particularly um, in these times when that certainly has, has, has uh, gained uh, even more attention. Um, what, are, what are some of the things that uh, you're pleased with and that you're proud of regarding our work around equity and, and perhaps even some areas where we need to redouble our efforts? I think the elementary racial literacy program that really this is the first year of it has been so tremendous to see and the excitement that the teachers bring to this work. I think for me that's been the most wonderful thing or one of the wonderful things about this year is when you hear the teachers talk about the work, it's so authentic, it feels very organic, it doesn't feel preachy, it feels like just this is how this is so important to us and this is what we want to do and, it, and, and are going to do for our students and families and I think back you know my kids are eighth grade and tenth grade and I wish that we had had they had had that in elementary school these these very natural and rich conversations I think are going to make such a difference as the kids move through the system and I think it also helps you know when kids are having these conversations in school it's it's much easier, particularly I think when they're younger and talk more with mom and dad and the you know adults at home who care for them, to to, ha to to bridge the gap between home and school with those types of conversations. I think that to me has been a real bright spot this year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've been the conversations. Of, they, they're in some ways so natural that as students you know uh, go through the grades, the conversations have become much more expected right. and and not episodic or surprising. Um, which is which is really what we need. I think the integration from kindergarten through 12th is something we've uh, really worked toward in the Needham Public Schools for all social and emotional learning. And I think um, equity is 
dovetails with that. And the fact that we're trying to get a K through 12 approach as opposed to spottiness or individual units is tremendously important. We had a lot of leadership from some of the high school students who still have their um, conversations. Can you tell me? Courageous that? conversations. Courageous conversations. Yep. But now it's starting very early. So this is all going to build as time goes on. And those courageous conversations will be happening at a younger and younger level, I think. I also think we're clear that with COVID-19, there are some inequities that we have to, we have to make sure that all of our, our students have act, access to resources, no matter where they are and what, what their home life is like, and that we have access to the medical needs for all. So it's a, it's a great way to look at it. I know I've learned a lot about it myself. Went to one of the professional development um, uh, sessions for the teachers, and it's where I got the first real grasp for myself at my age about it's not about being kind and taking care of other people, it's about understanding where all of this comes from and how it's ingrained in what, in our lives and the lives of our, our, our friends of color. And so I think it's, it's just a beginning for me. It's late to start, but we can never, we can always start something. Well, and, and I think one of, the, one of the best parts about it is that our students and their voice has carried through in this, yes. in this conversation. You know, more recently at a school committee meeting when you had some yeah. students who are uh, advocating a certain position, and those are students last June who, who took to the streets in Needham to protest racism and, and racial inequities. I mean, that we can't as adults just lean on the children to lead the way because we're the adults. However, when they do, we certainly don't want to get in their way, and we want to try to provide guidance and support. Uh, so that, that certainly has been powerful. You know, as uh, we're getting ready for town meeting, and uh, that'll be unusual again this year, outside, physically distant, all, all of that. Um, what's, what's the big message for town meeting, Andrea, this year? I think the big message um, when it comes to the school budget, the operating budget for next year, is that I think we've been very thoughtful and prudent about our request. We recognize that there are, um, you know, it's, it's a tough financial time for everybody, I think, you know, and for our town as well. And I think we've tried to be very thoughtful about our, what we've asked for. Um, the budget that we're asking town meeting to approve is sort of a traditional budget. It, it, it includes minimal COVID-related expenses. But we do know that there will be additional expenses that we are going to incur as this pandemic goes on. And we're going to ask town meeting to look at those in a more holistic way across the town, you know, in the future. I would say not necessarily for this town meeting, but for the future, I think coming down the pike for the schools, we have to address where our school administration is going to go long term. They cannot stay in their current location at the Emory Grover building without something. Something needs to be done with school administration. And I think also, you know, again, further out, uh, we completed a master plan this year and uh, school master plan process. And we really want to see that effort move forward and develop consensus across the town about what are the right capital building projects that we need to undertake, um, you know, in the intermediate term. We know we have, we have Mitchell in need and Pollard in need. And, and uh, the task is how can, you know, how, which do we tackle first and, and how right. do we go about that in a, in a thoughtful, efficient way that's affordable and there has to be a sense of urgency around it as well, you know, which is what I think you're, you're, you're sharing. Um, the other thing I would say is we continue to build on our portrait of Needham graduate on the equity work. <clears throat> the budget is our actual nuts and bolts, but in all of that, we're always thinking about supporting those very important aspects of our, our students' growth. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to share at town meeting. There'll be a lot, there'll be a lot ahead. Um, so as I as I think about uh, this past year, you know, I um, uh, I think what we've talked about is that health and safety have been and will remain a priority for all of our students and staff. We kind of begin and end there. If you don't feel safe in your school surroundings, you can't learn. Um, and we've always prioritized that. We'll continue to. I think uh, we're proud of, and we know that we have to redouble our efforts around equity and making sure that we're an anti-racist community. There are many things that I know the town is engaged in and that the schools can also help take the lead in around that. And also, you know, what we've shared is that despite the pandemic, we've kept the focus on learning. And there have been fits and starts, and it has been imperfect, and there are areas where we have fallen down. Our teachers, though, have been exceptional and extraordinary 
and our families have been amazing partners in helping pull this together during a health crisis. Um, and we're going to continue to do that as the, uh, uh, as the, as the year goes on into the summer and, in, and even into uh, next year. So, and, and finally, uh, Andrea, thank you for your leadership uh, over the past year because I think uh, your colleagues, the community, um, are very appreciative of everything you've done to help keep this superintendent level-headed and sane. And uh, I, I know the, the vice chair feels uh, the same way. We've appreciated your leadership and guidance. So thank you to both thank you. for thank uh, joining you. me today. Thank you for having us.